Good morning, Art History One. I hope you are doing fantastically well. Today we'll be wrapping up the medieval culture and finishing off looking at Gothic Cathedral and the ending of Gothic. Um, the end of Gothic, actually, as you can see behind me, is a style called Rayonant and generally considered one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful church in all the world, is the Saint-Chapelle, which was the French king's private chapel where they would go to worship and to be overwhelmed by the presence of God. Let me share my screen with you um, as I'm actually here in Paris. All right, when we, when, excuse me, when we last left off, we were actually looking at the Gothic cathedral and specifically the emphasis on stained glass. Remember the high Gothic period, really the, the, the epitome artwork, the church that is there is sharp. And that's basically because the stained glass there is unparalleled. There's more stained glass at Chart Cathedral than almost anywhere else in the world. And something we hadn't talked about yet with stained glass is just the enormous expense. As you can see, here's the lineup of all the different stained glass windows, which re replaced the historiated capitals, which used to tell the stories of the Bible in the Romanesque period. Remember those capitals that were very weird and, and dark and you could barely see them at the very top. Very beautiful sculptures for medieval, but nothing like we had seen in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. All that technology was lost. We're just coming out of the dark ages now as we're moving into the, the um, Romanesque and then later on to the Gothic period. Look at how beautiful we can actually tell the story now of the Last Supper, where you see the individual sitting around the table, Jesus um, enthroned right in the middle. The crucifixion, again, that, that imitation of spear bearer with the six pack abs, the um, very calm pose, the contrapposto turn, which we know crucifixion looked nothing like that. It was an arduous, torturous process. The resurrection, where the light actually look, kind of lights up and makes Jesus look beautiful and almost floating above everyone else. And then the heavy body of the deposition um, right beneath me, right here. And so these would be large scale. Now these are ridiculously expensive to create. And so that um, it's often in most churches, the stained glass costs as much as the entire rest of the church. And so generally what you'll do is you'll have, you'll find a sponsor that will actually sponsor each stained glass window. That's how expensive they are. So imagine today, you know, the resurrection brought to you by Walmart, the last supper brought to you by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The crucifixion brought to you by the Donald Trump Foundation. The deposition brought to you by Target. And this is actually how they were sponsored. The reason why individuals actually would sponsor these is because when you walked in and people would do tours when they were on a pilgrimage, they would say who sponsored them. And so you would know, oh, this person is, must be really holy. This person must be in God's favor. A, that God allowed them their business to be so successful, but B, if I'm going to shop, I'm going to shop then in the local stores. Oh, I'm going to go to the Target individual because I was really moved by the deposition. And so it would actually increase your business clout. So business people really saw this as a major investment, kind of way that we invest in the stock market or in future shares today. It was money given today towards God for the benefit of their business in the future and ridiculously expensive. Part of the reason it's so expensive is the materials. As I mentioned last time, ruby red sometimes was made would actually ground up rubies, not all the time, but with real ground up rubies. You see that really bright red, intense color. That's what we're looking at. Here we have a darker maroon color rather than a red. So that would actually have been made with mineral deposits. So it kind of depends on what was there. The other thing that made it so expensive, there's very few people in the world that know how to mix this particular, because basically stained glass is heated sand that's mixed with a a binding pigment agent that actually allows light to flow in and, and make beautiful, beautiful effects. This ethereal, almost heaven-like presence. Remember, the Gothic church is supposed to be heaven here on earth. Now, if you remember from last time, well, let's do a quick review. Let's make sure we know all of the Gothic features as we're moving forward, as we're well into the Gothic now, the high Gothic period. The Gothic features, remember, they all developed in the Romanesque period but they're unified by Abbot Sujet in Saint-Denis and all have a different Christian message. We have the pointed arch rather than the Roman arch. That pointed arch is a Muslim arch, but it allows the church to get a much more vertical, higher aspect, closer to God. We're gonna have flying buttresses that stick off the sides rather than regular buttresses. Those flying buttresses basically kind of hook off so light can actually flow through so you can get an extra window. 
We're going to have a two tower facade that shows the Trinity. We're going to have the vertical emphasis getting closer to God and the impact of, you know, dirty or just white light on the outside that somehow gets transformed and made beautiful and made holy, heavenly, when it actually comes through the stained glass, you get these blue, beautiful blues and greens. Note behind me, you see these lovely blues and greens. You don't see it from the other way out. You, you know, you, they basically appear like brown or dark brown windows until you're on the inside. Why? The outside is supposed to be this world. The gargoyles are there to scare you in all their different capacities. Please come inside. You come inside, you wash yourself, you purify yourself. Then you see the beautiful stained glass showing you, hey, you've arrived in heaven. Now, this is a video I showed you from last time, but just a, rem a, a reminder as we're looking through, I want to show you just a little bit more about how that light moves. It really is a spectacular achievement. Unfortunately, as the windows get larger like behind me in the Ray Anand style, I mean, that's just absolutely stunning. That's all natural light. It's just a, a, an elapsed video over time. You can see how thin the lines then become in between each piece of glass. The thinner the line, the more light that actually comes in. But those light, those thin lines are important because they help support the glass to make sure the glass doesn't crack rather than have large pieces of glass. Now, at Chart Cathedral, that elevation, that elevation of the high Gothic to its most beautiful, one of the other things that happens is um, Chartres Cathedral is a Notre Dame Cathedral. Note, there are thousands, there are five hundreds of thousands of Notre Dame Cathedral, which means Our Lady. And these are representations of a new way of thinking about the Virgin Mary. Notre, Notre Dame or Notre Dame means Our Lady. And so in Chartres, we have our first church that is dedicated to the creation of the cult of the Virgin. We are starting to emphasize this emphasize Christ's humanity. And so, for example, one of the reasons why Chart is the perfect place for this, if so you look at the relics over here on the right-hand side, Mary's tunic, which I had mentioned before when we did pilgrimage talk about a week ago, and St. Anne's head, which is Mary's mother, they both emphasize the fact that, that Mary, as well as her son, were these Christian human individuals. Mary's tunic, remember, is the piece of cloth that the Virgin Mary supposedly wore at Christ's crucifixion. And as I said, the historical tests show that it very much could be. So we have at the very top, it's, it dates from the exact right time, 30 um, circa CE, which is, we, we think that Christ was born somewhere around, or was crucified somewhere around 32. So that's right in a time frame. The cotton is from the exact right place in Israel. There is a male blood stain that we cannot, identi cannot identify. It's been saved three times from fire, often during miraculous beams or things falling over to protect it. And it was actually a gift from Charlemagne himself. And so it has been in use and thought of as Mary's tunic for well over 1,200 years at this point. And so that's one of the things that shows up. It was the creation of the cult of the Virgin where we start emphasizing Christianity. And this is literally going to lead to an explosion of this type of thought during the Renaissance. So we're getting closer and closer and inching to the rebirth of the entire classical world, the Greco-Roman world in the Renaissance. Today, if you were to go to one of these churches, a number of these churches do these beautiful shows on the outside, and they basically are trying to imitate what you would see if you were going on the inside. They basically are using God's love and beauty to try to attract you to the inside of the church. Remember, during the, the Gothic period, the point was to scare you. You knew what the inside of the church looked like. It looks like this, and it looks like this. It's spectacular. It's gorgeous. And on the outside, you have those gargoyles that are waiting with those horrid faces saying, get inside. This looks like hell. And so they very much are trying to kind of play off with that aspect. Other places have used this also as a marketing strategy. If you haven't been to Walt Disney World recently, here is their new stained glass effect inspired show at night. You see, just like we saw with Shark Cathedral, with the beautiful light, they're going to use the castle, which, let's face it, is based upon um, a, a castle that has some Christian connotations in, in Germany. 
you can see how they're going to play. We're going to fast forward a little bit just to show you the different effects. Very much the same the same way you have that time lapse video. And that's why I introduced that time lapse video again in the stone glass. And they keep throwing up different pictures. They tie it to different songs. One of my favorite Disney songs. As you can see, it's about a 15 minute show where they're going to use it to show good, to show bad, to run through the whole human gamut of kind of their emotional outpouring and their stories. And that's what we have at the very end. It ends with the magic and then the fireworks display start right after. But they're using the exact same thing that we saw earlier in the stained glass with this idea of trying to overwhelm you and get you to believe that you were in a magical place in the Gothic Cathedral, it's heaven. In Disney, it's the happiest place on earth, or so they claim. So one of the questions that comes up as a cultural consultant, remember we ran this activity a couple times, but most recently, I think in ancient Egypt, where we looked at the Katy Perry video, and it's how well does Disney do the creating a tar cartoon version of Notre Dame Cathedral? On the very top line are the actual images from Notre Dame Cathedral, and on the bottom are Disney's creation of it. So very much you can see the gothic features that show up remarkably well in the exterior. The rose window and the, the size and scale of the rose window. To show you a semblance in real life, this is 55 feet around. So it is remarkably huge. And each one of these are about 55 feet tall. Those are those windows way up there. So the question for all of you to consider is, how well does Disney do in creating a cartoon version of Notre Dame Cathedral? And as we move on, we've got to you look at the last style of Gothic. The last style of Gothic is really Rayonaut. <clears throat> this is the Sainte Chapelle. This is what I am actually right in front of and underneath today. And basically what it is, it's a cage of glass. That's actually its nickname, cage of glass. Note, during this time period, you've got to wonder, how on earth does this chapel stand up? There's basically no wall. Everywhere you turn, as you spin around this place, everywhere there's just glass that is floating on these tiny little support systems the flying butchers and buttressing and their architectural knowledge had progressed so far in the 200 years since romanesque and now gothic had begun that they could create these wonderful 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 open-ended literally holy resplendent and of course this is reserved for the king so this is the king's private chapel from the outside, you would never expect this kind of beauty and marvelousness. And that's the king's, this is what it looks like on the outside. So these are the windows. No, the little, they're not even flying buttresses. They're just very narrow buttresses that now they've actually figured out the support system to make this, and this is an amazing place. So generally considered, if not the most beautiful church in the world, one of the most beautiful churches in the world. And as such, and note how short the time frame is, right? The, rather than taking decades, it took only eight years. It's remarkable for something of this achievement. The gold that you see is real gold. It's gold leaf that has actually been placed upon. And here you get a really good image then of a groin vault, of an arch and another arch hitting it at 90 degrees. So remember when we talked about Roman architecture, how supportive the arch was, how even more supportive it is when you have the pointed arch. Now if you took po two pointed arches and put them at 90 degrees, it's almost impossible to destroy. It would take a direct hit in some kind of capacity. A natural, a natural disaster would blow the windows in potentially. Say they had hurricane force winds, but they don't get um, in uh, Paris, where this is the Saint Chapelle. It might blow the windows in, but the structure um, is so supportive that good shot that the roof actually still stays today, the vaulting of the roof. So it's a pretty remarkable. <clears throat> and so all we can say for this is our Baroque Hallelujah. And this is the experience people would have when walking in this. Remember, your house is made out of wood. It's very small, it's very squat, it stinks. The animals live with you in many capacities. We are just moving out of that period from the dark ages. So this is a revelation for anyone who's allowed to come inside. But this is how the kings in the upper class were living. And 
one of the things that I wanted to point out with that music is exactly that. One of my favorite experiences I've had with my kids and with my family upon traveling is that we actually went and we spent a little bit of extra money to have dinner in this particular chapel in Saint Chapelle. Now you don't have to do this. You can actually go during the day, pay your ticket money to come in. But, but for about $15 more, we got a live concert as well as had dinner medieval style where they serve uh, kind of like medieval times if you've ever been to that restaurant up in Orlando or another part of the country where you literally can watch jousting and actually eat. Clearly there's no jousting here, but you get a classical music concert in the environment how the king would have experienced his chapel himself. There's some Gregorian chants that they show. And so if you ever go to Paris, it's, it's on Ile de Cité. It's right across from basically all the action. So Notre Dame Cathedral is literally an eight minute walk from here, um, right across on the other river Seine, where you have the artist quarter and the Latin quarter, the Rodin Museum are very close. The Louvre is a 12 minute walk, a 10 minute walk from here. And so it's very centrally located. And for about 30 bucks then, normally you pay 15 or $18 to get in, depending upon the time of year, you would actually get to go in and have a small dinner while you're listening to a concert in the area, the same way the French kings would have done. It's also during this time period, they have limited ticket sales during the summer. And so it's a great way of seeing it without a lot of tourists. You actually get a special seat, reserved seat. It's a pretty remarkable thing. So I would highly encourage you if you have the money while you're here, this is one of those things that's kind of once in a lifetime, a very cool experience. Now, one of the things that shows up is that once Gothic gets invented, it's associated with France right off the bat. And everyone knows it's French. Aha, viva la France, it's French Gothic. And so Chartres Cathedral is absolutely seen um, as the Gothic, but it's seen as the best style of architecture as well. And so people that have enemies, particularly the English, who are enemies and have been enemies with France going all the way back to the Battle of Hastings and who actually owns England, who owns France. Is the English king that should be sitting on the French throne? Is the French king sitting on the English throne? They've had wars and problems that will lead us, not just here, but for the future centuries. And so the same way that the French borrowed, took the Roman arch and borrowed it into the pointed Muslim arch, remember that, take it there, that very pointed Muslim arch, the English are going to do the same thing. They're not going to call it Gothic. They're going to call it English Gothic. And the most famous example of this is Salisbury. But in order to do that, you need to make some changes, as I'll show you in a moment if you look at these two. So if you look at the two, what are some of the differences that you see? How do the English get away with calling it English Gothic and not everyone knowing it's French Gothic, besides the fact that they can control the media and the press? But if where people were to travel to both France and England to see the dates when these were born, how would they know the difference? And I'll give you a moment to ponder that, and then we'll walk through the answer. So here are the changes that happen. That the English changed to make it English Gothic. First, it's going to be Christ on the cross versus the cross itself. Note, we don't have the rounded arch that would show the head of Christ. What we actually have is the square off, and that square off is really just for the cross itself. That little change was part of it. They're going to have the circular, and that's here, the circular versus the square apse. That's the apse is where the, the head of Jesus would be. That's my cursor. So right up here, rather than it being round again with the crown of thorns, we're just going to have it squared off. Two towers, they're going to make multiple towers, as you can see. There will even be multiple towers over the crossing. That's where the transept and the nave interrupt. They're going to put a tower there which of course you never see or almost never see within a Gothic cathedral. That would mean the tower is right here in French Gothic. Some towers, they might have 14 or 15 different towers. Remember, we can't quite make domes yet. We're just getting at least in the idea of Western Europe. Their groin vaults, rather than using groin vaults, they're gonna use some weird vaults, six part toe. Groin vault is two arches, pointed arches coming together. Very beautiful, two arch, two arch. There's another one there, you see one coming there. Note here, looks like a spider web. They're going to have cross hatching and, and moving, and they might have six point vaults and eight point vaults. So, the vaulting they're actually going to make much more decorative, and that decoration is actually one of the things. And note also, this is actually in scale. Note French Gothic goes high. The whole idea is vertical, getting closer to God. 
English Gothic. Wath are going to be tall, well over 100 feet tall, which is unusual for any architecture from the time period. Note how wide and horizontal they're going to make the emphasis. Those small changes, basically, they borrowed from French Gothic, is basically what they're going to call English Gothic. And I guarantee you, if the English and the French were not at work, they would have just taken the French Gothic wholeheartedly and said, because it is a better style of, of architecture. It is the new Renaissance style Gothic high that actually is going to be dominant across the planet for the better part of 300 years. So one of the most famous Gothic cathedrals then, and it's famous not just for the style West of architecture. Yeah. This Westminster. So the other thing I want to do now that we've actually looked at churches, and you've seen a number of churches, you'll see some of the churches that we've actually talked about on this, but this is generally considered the 14 most beautiful churches in the world. And so here, there, it's about six minutes away. And there's no other church in the world that looks anything like the Gaudi in Sevilla. Notre Dame, right, the basis of the hunchback of Notre Dame, the birth of high Gothic architecture, the perfect symmetry, it dominates the skyline. Note that's still only half the height of the Great Pyramids at the time period. And it's very famous for the giant gargoyles, which you saw in The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Disney, if you've seen that movie. If you go to Venice, Italy, this is their dominant cathedral, right out St. Mark's Cathedral. Um, there's a huge area where people play games. Um, there's a number of different shops right out there. It was the heart of the city in the city center. Markets used to take place there. And of course, St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. This is the residency of the Pope. It's the smallest landmass nation on earth. It's about five square kilometers. So once you walk on the property, you are no longer in Italy. You actually can get your own postage stamps um, and they have one of the great museums. This of course is where the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo is. And the dome here was designed by Michelangelo as the largest dome in the world until we developed modern architecture. Everything that you're seeing there is real gold. And that's where St. Peter, the first Pope, was buried, or is buried still today. That's Michelangelo's Pieta. There's a number of Michelangelo's that are owned by the Pope. He was the dominant patron for Michelangelo's work. And so that ends our tour, at least of the churches. We want to spend a couple of minutes then looking at the artwork itself inside the churches and inside the altars where you would go to pray and how that actually changes over time as well. And so on your, on your left over here, the Maista, which basically means mother and child, the Maista by an artist named Chim Abue, Chim Abue from 1280, versus the crucifixion by Giotto from the Arena Chapel in 1305. Chim Abue is Giotto's teacher. And so this is one of the cases where you actually see the, the student clearly out surprising her and out surpassing the talent of what the master was able to do within the guild system. So basically, this is going to take us, if you look at the Chimabue, it's very gothic. It's very medieval still in its design. Remember the illuminated manuscripts and how awkward some of the poses of the artwork look. No, Chimabue is much better than the illuminated manuscripts, but it's still very flat. It's still, you know, not emotional. It doesn't really look like human bodies taking a full three-dimensional forms. They're almost like play setting. And even the, the posture and the hand gesture that um, the Virgin Mary makes to the Jesus child, who looks like a, a, a little four-year-old rather than a baby, um, is pretty indicative of what we're looking at during the time period of the Gothic. Then if you move over to the right, look how the bodies start to take shape. 
you get a little bit of hunch that actually shows up, more like a real body. You're starting to get some emotional reaction. The faces look way more realistic. There's some shading where this is fairly flat. So, and then we have the, the gold leaf put in the background. So look how much more realistic this looks with the drapery folds. And that really is slowly bringing us into the Renaissance, the rebirth of all of these art and all of these skills that we've learned from empiricism, from Aristotle, from Plato, from Polycletus, from, from all the Greeks and the Romans before, we're moving into a different direction. Giotto is really the master that basically moves us towards the Renaissance, at least into an artistic style. And as you look at it, the typical medieval features then are going to be things like a belief in God's daily involvement in the arts. They're going to be cartoonish and non-realistic images, which you do see a little bit in both of these still. There's going to be a vertical emphasis. Know how each one draws your attention upward. There's going to be an emphasis on heaven versus hell. We don't see this in either one yet. And finally, these artworks are all meant for an illiterate population. So the salvation comes with the church. Now you can understand the virgin presenting her child here in Christ in the Maista. You can understand the crucifixion because you know that story from Christian teaching. But who everyone else is, except outside of Mary, Ma maybe Mary Magdalene weeping at Christ's feet, someone would have to tell you who all these different figures are. And so they could use it as a pedagogical tool. So that would be used to help it to educate the illiterate population. Now, this is an artwork that changed the world. This particular Giotto that we just saw from, this is called the Arena Chapel, or also known as the Scrovaini Chapel. Scrovaini is spelled up here, S-C-R-O-V-E-G-N-I. It was called Arena because it was built on the site of an ancient Roman arena. They put a church on some of the church conquests, conquests the ancient Romans, but it was owned by the Scrovaini family itself. It's in Padua, about a 30 minute train ride outside of um, Venice. If you ever have the opportunity of going to Venice, I would highly recommend stopping here for a day spot. It is an amazing city to actually look around to see what medieval life and Renaissance life looked like for um, in, in ancient Italy as we're showing up. And so this is called the Scrovini Chapel. Now the Scrovinis made this because their father um, used to lend money to various other individuals because they were wealthy for a fee. Basically, he was a banker back then. But banking was called usury, was considered one of the worst sins. And so he clearly was going to end up in hell. So as a way of getting him out of hell, his family made this beautiful jewel-like little chapel so that God would see it and the Pope would see it and would raise him out of hell and say, look how healthy, look how happy, look how this money, yes, he got it from usury, but look what great deeds that he did in terms of the service of God. So he created this to get the master Scrovini out of hell for terrible sin of usury, so basically for money lending. Today, we just call that banking, and nobody has a problem with it. Hundreds of years ago, this was one of the worst sins you could have. So this is by the Gothic master Giotto. And note, what's interesting is on the inside, and here I'll show you the Rick Steve, so you get a really good image of the Scrovini. And I'm going to pause this for a moment just to give you a, an overview. So this is the first time we actually ever get what's called the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is a fancy word. It means Apocrypha is A-P-O-C-R-Y-P-H-A. A-P-O-C-R-Y-P-H-A, Apocrypha. And basically it is all the stories that we want to know or that know about Jesus's life, but also about the Virgin Mary's life and even the Virgin Mary's mother's life. So there's three different series of paintings that wrap around the entire chapel. And each one tells a different sequence. So it's the life of the Virgin, it's the life of the Virgin and early Jesus, then it's the ministry of Jesus. And so in those, these kind of, I think there's 32 different paintings. In these 32 different paintings, you get a really good overview of the life of Jesus, which had never been depicted before. So he basically combines all of these. Now there's not always uh, historical references that show up in writing. And so we cannot necessarily go back and say, all right, this really happened. This really took place in this way. That's why we call it apoc apocryphal. It means we believe this to be happened based upon history and what happened before, but we don't have a way of doing it. And so that's what we're looking at. So he basically canonizes the way that we think about the miracles of Jesus that had never really been depicted before. And if we pick up right here, here's his last judgment. Now think about this. This church is incredibly valuable 
um, not just for the material and for Giotto's work, kind of establishing and moving us towards the Renaissance. It's so valuable that it's an interesting experience to stop over in Padua to see this for the experience on how we protect art. So here's what happens. First off, you have to make reservations days in advance because only about 100 people are allowed to enter in any given day in two different waves, one early in the morning and one in the afternoon. And that is because the way that they do it is that you show up. So we showed up for the, I think it was the 9 a.m. So we showed up at 8.30. At 8.30, you get into line. And the first thing they do is they do an entire security check, um, just like we would do in any modern day. So that's, that's fine. The second stage is once you go through the security check, you go into this room, which is a little discombobulating with all these other people that you're coming with, the 50 of you. You stay together then throughout the entire time. And they close the doors and the doors are airtight. What they're going to do is they're going to suck out the water vapor. They're going to suck out the ozone. And you spend eight to 10 minutes in that room, basically having all of the pollutants in the environment taken off so it doesn't disrupt the colors. Then you go into another room and it does basically the same thing. Then you get 35 to 40 minutes to actually walk around in a group of 50. So it's very open. You get to see everything for a very limited short amount of time. And then you get out. But it's the way that they actually do to try to preserve this ancient artwork. Because there's really no other way of preserving it unless you were to take it off piece by piece. And that would really ruin the Scrovaney Chapel as a chapel to look this jewel-like structure that later on is going to become our Sistine Chapel. So the colors are really very accurate from when, when Scrovenes um, paid for it and paid Giotto in 1305. It's a remarkable, kind of very cool experience. I will mention, if you go to the small little town, one of my favorite things in the entire world is there's actually a little restaurant in Padua that I would highly recommend that also has a hotel called Toscanelli, T-O-S-C-A-N-E-L-L-I. My wife and I love chocolate, and it's the best hot chocolate we've ever had. It's this beautiful milk that's actually mis mixed with high quality um, chocolate. The chocolate bars are actually melted in. It's fantastic. It's almost like drinking liquid chocolate mousse. So you can have that um, right before you go over and see this lovely, lovely jewel. And here's the layout then to show you all the different stories that become the apocryphal, going all the way down from the life of Joaquin, um, the life of the Virgin, the life of Jesus and all the miracles laid out so you can follow it in order. The nativity scene. So on some level, the arena chapel on the top, you can see it's a model for Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. It canonized what's called the apocryphal biblical stories that are not necessarily in the Bible, but are support materials for the Bible. And Giotto is known very much for these 3D physical forms with folding drapery with some shadows the nativity scene, as you see on the right, is right out of the Bible. You know, we saw a nativity scene. So this is in the manger, in this open area, three wise men, goats, donkeys, um, asses, um, the angels there crying out on what the miracle that's just befalling us. And here's the crucifixion, the one we saw before. So we compared it with this master, Chimabue. The emotion here is just spectacular for anything that we've seen in art really since the expressionist period or the Hellenistic period of ancient Greece. It is just better than anything else. The small little gestures, the Mary Magdalene leaning in and crying at Christ's feet, the individuals exchanging gifts and supporting um, Christ's mother. Note that would have been eye contact that took place as he dived. Just a powerful moving image for people in the 1300s that had never seen art like this before. It was just the new. And that monster. That monster straight out of Dante, really going from the blue devil of a fallen beautiful angel to this monster terror figure is very much a Dante-esque image. Note still in the color of blue. So in class, and we won't be able to do this because it's online, but in class, we would do its human body architecture. We would lay this out. I'd show you. So where you, I'm looking for my cursor. Let me find my cursor and then I'll get to you. There. So where we would have four of you basically act like these peers. So these would basically be columns. So this is an aerial view. And so you would be a column here. That would be someone's head. That would be someone's head. That would be some if you reach out your arms and you four in a central point, basically what you are forming then is a groin vault. Remember, if you reach this way, you're forming a barrel vault or an arch, and a series of arches in a row is a barrel vault. So, or an arcade, actually it could be either one. So when we look at the three-dimensional, it's actually um, the idea of a 
kind of looks like this. So that would be a barrel vault. So when you look across, we have four of them, that will form a groin vault. And what we learned is that by we could actually hang someone off of this, we would let them dangle from the four of you because each of you only holds up one fourth of the weight. So we actually have created a very stable form. Buttressing then, note these push on one another, these lines right here, that buttress pushes on it. So that's just gonna be another arch. So here we have, remember, the nave, the aisles on the outside, the transept, which is the cross of Christ, the apse, which is the head, the radiating chapels, once again, which are going to be um, the, the true cross and the choir area right here up north of the transept, which is going to be where the lectures or where the pulpit is for the minister or for the priest. So we basically have human body architecture. As we look at this, and some of these are unknown, some of them are known, is I want you just to consider how religious theology, particularly in the medieval world, impacts this unknown Gothic cathedral. Now, you should be able to walk into a Gothic cathedral if for most parts you don't need me. You actually know the features of Gothic. And the features of Gothic are how many towers? What's the emphasis in terms of height? What do they do with light? And why is that important? Why do we need flying buttresses? And what's the significance of flying buttresses? And so when you put all of those things together, you get a Gothic cathedral. And so you can explain what is the religious significance behind it. Again, please remember that the Gothic cathedral were the center of the home, the center of the city. You can see that they still dominate the skyline today, no matter whether you're in Rome, Amiens, Florence, Siena, Jerusalem, Medina. Um, the Medina image is interesting because it's actually not a church, but actually is the mosque. That's the prophet's mosque that shows up here. But no, it still dominates the city, largely an idea that comes out of some of the Gothic cathedrals as well, these large scale shapes. And so what? Why study Gothic cathedrals? And that's why I have Medina beneath you. It's a standard for Christian architecture still today. In the U.S., 72% of people would rather worship in a Gothic cathedral than anywhere else. It's the one time in human history, at least so far, when technology, engineering, and philosophy all merged to create the unimaginable, create heaven. It's the best example to show how humankind's relationship with God can be altered through art. You literally can change the way that you feel like you're walking into heaven on earth. And in a modern world with the rise of Islam and mosque architecture, seen down here in Medina, this area right here, the Prophet's Mosque, it's important to understand how religion, philosophy, and art merge. Why do we try to avoid attacking people in mosques? Like if we go to war with someone, we generally don't attack mosques, the same way that in general churches are not attacked. It's what the mosque or the church stands for, as much as any of the civilian casualties that might be inside of. Right? These are generally religious, holy individuals where God and humanity come together for the best of both, or where Allah and the community come to together for the best of both in a mosque. And so there is a real symbiotic kind of relationship on why these buildings are so important and still functional. I mean, think about this. These are buildings that are some of them 800, 900, 1,000 years old, and they still stand and function today. You think any of the buildings that we make right now are gonna be still functional in a thousand years? Even in New York City, when you look at kind of large scale Empire State Building, which is already dated and from 1932, it's been retrofitted a couple of times, chances are it's not going to be there functioning a thousand years later, right? In 20 or 3020, just chances are against us. It doesn't happen all that often. The last thing that I wanna throw at you for today and again, this goes into your video for the week, is this. If you've never heard of this, this is called Bloom's Taxonomy. And basically, it actually asks you different ways that we organize information and knowledge. So the very basic piece of information that we need people to have is recognizing and recalling facts. That's remember, right? That on some level can form a cultural heritage that hopefully all of you remember that are founding in the signing of the Declaration of Independence, freeing us from what country, in what year, that gives us kind of a national pride that shows up. The next is understanding what those facts mean. Why was that important? Why did we revolt? The next thing from Britain in 1776, if you don't remember. Then we wanna apply the facts, rules, concepts, and ideas in a new way. We wanna break down the information into its component parts and judging the value of information or ideas. Now note how the, the chart gets smaller and smaller because we want everyone to be able to do all of them but the ones at the top to create, to evaluate, to analyze that are in the orange, yellow, and green are much more difficult. They're higher order brain functioning. 
So one of the things that I've been doing all semester long is every question that I've asked you, either on a quiz, on the midterm, has been associated, hey, is this them creating knowledge? Is this them evaluating knowledge? Is this them analyzing knowledge? Is this them applying, understanding, or remembering knowledge? Most of the quiz information are in the remember, understand, apply. Most of the midterm questions are in the create, evaluate, and analyze. And your semester of a long project is also in the create, evaluate, and analyze, as well as some of your notes where you have to apply that third question. So all semester, as I've been applying grades, I've been monitoring your Bloom's taxonomy. So at the end of the semester, I can tell you where you stand, how well you are able to remember information, how well you're able to understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. So if you go to the end of your grade book, you'll note there are a bunch of different columns that are Bloom's taxonomy, and four of them, I think I've matched out, create, evaluate, analyze, and understand. Um, and so all of those things have actually been marked out. The number that is there will tell you the percentage. When, we, when I've mapped previous students and also look at national averages, that's the percent of how well you've done. If you're in the 90%, let's say, for create, congratulations, you're at the very top of individuals that combine different parts to make an entire new whole. I said from the very get-go, art is one of the most difficult subject matters, academic areas to study. And that is because to truly understand art, you've got to be able to analyze, evaluate, and create at the top of the pyramid. Because you have to take religion, science, economics, aesthetics, um, philosophy, um, different art aesthetics and manipulation, a little bit of psychology, you need to, be able to co uh, combine them together to get a holistic way, the way the art works and manipulates people into the world. And so that will give you a stat of where you are doing. Do not, it's not evaluative in terms of the grade at all, it's just something that I like to see kind of where our students go and how far, because I can look at over time, how far have you come within my one class to help you guide if you're giving instruction without even knowing it, how do you start to develop the creation, the evaluation, the analysis? And so it does give you an overview at the end of the term, specifically where you stand versus people that are coming out with very similar backgrounds from you. So if you're in the upper ranges, congratulations. If you're in the lower ranges, don't worry about it. Just means, remember, your brain is not fully formed till you're 25. So one of two things, you either have not developed that skill because of one, when those more difficult questions come up, you kind of just rely on remembering and applying information rather than trying to create your own information. That's something we need you to do in the future. Um, and particularly as you get into the job market, people want, if you note, and if you look at any job skills that are out there, do a Google search on jobs on any skills that you want. They're not gonna be about remembering. Hey, can they remember you know, what I told them to do? Can they remember? No one wants that as a job skill. Look at the numbers above though, or look at the, the things that they ask. They're going to want you to critique, evaluate, analyze. They're going to want to see those upper level skills. So here, you know, we have to develop those skills. So that's one. If you have not developed them already, start thinking about how do I put information together? How do I organize my thoughts so that I combine potentially even different classes and ideas together or critique the professor because I see something differently? More than happy within that because that's when you're using your critical, your evaluate, and your analyze skills. The other one, um, the other one is that you haven't kind of developed it because you just haven't been given the opportunity yet. And when you are given the opportunity, then take those seriously. Once you develop those skills, generally the research shows that you don't lose them. You just apply them in new formats. So they are applicable once you develop an art. They're applicable once you go for a job. They're applicable um, even in your own home life when you're trying to evaluate and critique it. Is the house worth buying it? Versus, oh, I remember it's $210,000. I only have 140. What's the quality of life? How do you critically evaluate and analyze all of those things? And that's what we're looking at with Bloom's taxonomy. And so how does the concept of death and afterlife change over our earliest art history? Remember, we saw everything. We even did this thing right around midterm. Now we just have to add in the Christian faith. The big Christian faith basically taking the idea of Egypt and extending that with a monotheistic God. So that's something you should be able to do for your final exam. I'll let you do that on your own. And that will end us in terms of kind of Gothic cathedral and Gothic art. If you have any questions, please let me know. Have a wonderful day. Bye.